Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a nice, brisk, like 28 degrees. We're supposed to get down to like 19 degrees tonight. So, water's starting to become an issue with the uh, animals. Um, the electrician has to get here in a hurry and get some stuff done today. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to hook up a GFCI receptacle in the horse stall to power the water heater for the horse trough. So, we have uh, have a 100 amp sub panel in the barn and over here we have the horse stalls it's two stalls um, we have this one here you'll see the receptacle over there well the box I should say right there and down below you'll notice there's a hole in the wall and we have a hundred gallon trough that goes between the two stalls and the horses share that so what we're gonna do is we're gonna get you set up and we're gonna put in the GFCI We'll bring the water trough back in. We've drained it and got it out of our way just to make it easier to work. We'll bring that in and get that filling while we hook up the other end in the uh, electrical panel. So let's get you set up and we'll go ahead and get this done. Okay, we've got you now in the stall. We have our GFCI receptacle that we're going to use here with cover. We got this from our local electrical supply house. You could use a GFCI breaker as well. The breakers are just a lot more expensive and uh, I just didn't see the need for it. Um, I'm going to give you a little tutorial on the GFCI in a minute, but the one thing I want to point out is that on a GFCI, or most of the ones I've ever used, there's an actual clamp for the wire to stick into, so we don't bend a hook in the wire like we do on the uh, regular receptacles. The other thing I want to point out on a GFCI is that as it goes in and it goes out, and what I mean by that is if you wanted to have, like, say, six receptacles protected by a GFCI, You'd come into the GFCI receptacle, you know, and you see the buttons on it, on the front, you know, on the top side, which is called line. I don't know if you can read that right there. And then you'd come out of the bottom, which will be labeled load underneath that sticker. Um, they put the sticker on here to let you know, you know, that these are not the screws to use if it's a standalone receptacle. It's very important that the, the power flows in the right direction through this, otherwise it can't monitor what's going on downstream. If you was to feed it on these two, it wouldn't work at all. If you fed it here and tied your neutrals together up here and only fed the hot out, it wouldn't work either. So, you know, read the directions, make sure you pay attention to that. That is a, where it is set way different than a regular receptacle. So you have to come in on the top, out on the bottom. The big thing is, you know, top and bottom is not, that's a poor term in receptacle world because you'll notice on the front, the words are written both ways. So which way is upside down? It's a darn good question. Typically in an application where I'm worried about anything, I mount my receptacles this way, and that way the ground plug is at the top, nothing can fall down onto the prongs, and if it does start to pull out, the prongs aren't exposed. Um, there is no right or wrong way. It's kind of like Ford versus Chevy. So I shouldn't be saying top and bottom on here. What I really need to tell you is to look for line and look for load, and that's it. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to get this ready. You'll notice there is a strip gauge on the back of most of these. It'll tell you how long to strip your wire. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to strip our wires out so it'll fit into that. And we go about 5 eighths of an inch is what we're looking for. I want your wire nice and straight to get into the back of that. And then on this receptacle, you'll actually see on this one, it says white and black, or hot. Hot could be black, red, there's a whole variety of colors. Typically in a single wire circuit, you're going to have a black wire, a white wire, and a bare ground wire. You may see a red wire in some cases, but typically in residential, it's always going to be black and white. You get into commercial, there's a whole list of colors that can be your hot conductor. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to put that white silver screw, large side of the receptacle, under that clamp. I'm going to loosen the screw up a little bit. And we get that in under that clamp. And we can see it right on the other end there. You probably can't see it on camera. And we're going to go ahead and tighten that white wire down. And then we're going to do the same with the ground.
And then we're going to do the same with the hot, in our case, the black wire. So let's see if we can get you right in there and look at that. So hold on a second. There's a pretty good shot right there. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and put the receptacle into its socket. Again, according, 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 yeah, accordion style the wires back in there. And make sure the ground doesn't touch anything important. Oh, and I put it upside down. <laughs> upside down, right side up. Again, opinions. In my case, I definitely want it this way because I want to make sure that that ground wire protects the other two prongs if the horses should try to drop something down in there. We're probably going to end up building a box over this. Um, the horse that's in this stall is actually very um, calm, doesn't actually tend to chew or play or anything with stuff like that. Matter of fact, he really doesn't even like to come in the stall. He likes to hang out at his feet or outside and chow away all day. So now what we're going to do is we're going to find our small bladed screwdriver and in this multi-purpose screwdriver here it's a little weird like the other end of that is a square drive I have to pull that out and I think it's yeah it's under this other square drive right there is our small regular screwdriver that we're going to use on our cover. Okay, so just a quick briefer on a receptacle here, and then we'll get on to the electrical panel. Um, on the, let me see if I can get you in here in a good shape. On the receptacle, you'll have a narrow and a wide. The wide blade is always your, your neutral, and that way you cannot plug your neutral into your hot conductor. And the reason for that is if you've got a, an older appliance or lamp or something that only has two prongs and it's metal, a lot of times the neutral on the lamp is actually connected to the metal frame. So as you can imagine, if you got that backwards and plug that in, and the frame of the lamp was connected to your hot conductor, you know, there's a pretty good chance you could get lifted, electrocuted, something like that. So we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna stop this now. We're gonna get the water trough back in here and filling so the horses can have water. And we'll bring you back and we'll show you how to hook up the part in the electrical panel. So we're back at our sub panel. Sub panel is fed from the house. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take the cover off this get the breaker installed so we can get power to that GFCI and, and plug in the uh, heater. So we like to use our square drive, and I think it's actually the other square drive. The square drive bit, Let's see if you can see that. All your electrical stuff, your cover screws, your breaker, they all have that square drive socket in them, and it makes it so much nicer than a flathead screwdriver. And then you got to be careful when you take this cover off. I like to hold my arm like this because if you let the cover swing on one of the uh, screws, it may break the breakers or turn them off or cause some unwanted issues inside. So I like to lean my arm against it and hold it. If you had somebody else helping you, you could hold it while they took the screws out. But essentially, try to keep it from moving. Some of the bigger panels have keyholes where this sets into the, into the frame and you don't have to hold it, but on these ones you do. Now we've already run our wire previously before we finished up the barn. So we're gonna take our Romex connector and we're gonna put that in the top. Word of caution on the Romex connectors, when you tighten these two screws down, just snug them up so the wire doesn't move real easy. You don't wanna crank them right down because you will damage the wire. Could cause a fire or shorten the wire and have nuisance tripping of your breaker. In the top of the panel, we're going to see if we can get you up here and see this. You'll see these knockouts right here. We're going to go ahead and knock this one right here out. One that is cleaned off. And that's where we're going to put our Romex connector. 
The power is on in this panel. I would advise when you're doing this, you actually shut the power off. I like to grab my knockout after I've got it bent down, my pliers, and break it off and that way I control it and it doesn't fall into something we don't want it to fall into. The nut goes on the bottom, my mix connector goes down through the hole like that. And what I do is I like to start my Romex connector about 90 degrees past the direction I want it to face. So like in this case, we'll see if we can get you up here and see it. You'll see I've got the screws pointed, I want them pointed out towards me and they're pointed that way. What that's going to allow me to do is hold the nut and turn the uh, Romex connector about a quarter of a turn clockwise. And that makes it a lot easier than trying to you know, get up in there and turn the knot. You could take a flat bladed screwdriver and a hammer and you could tap that nut. But I have pretty good luck just grabbing that from my pliers like that, turning that Romex connector where I want it, and life is good. So we're going to pull this wire down through there now. And we're going to snug that up once we find our screwdriver. And again, these have that little square tip, so no need to change the tip on the screwdriver. And I'll show you what I mean by snugging this up. So I'll try to keep my arm out of the way. You can see I can move the wire pretty easy. See, right about there, the wire starts to move pretty hard. I mean, I can still move it if I pull, but it moves pretty hard. And that's kind of what we want. We don't want to crank it down so tight that we damage the wire. And we're going to go ahead by putting our knife blade right in the middle on top of the ground connector and holding our hands together. We won't slip and hit our hands. And we're also controlling the knife that we don't drop it into something live inside the panel. So you only have to do a little bit of your regular Romex like this. And you can peel your conductors right out of it like that. There's my three conductors. And you can get everything out like that. Reach in there and trim that conductor back while you're not, I mean, no, not the conductor, the jacket. And then the whole thing will just slide right off, just like that. I like to take my insulated conductors up out of my way. And I like to get my ground wire done first because it's a bare wire and I just worry that something could touch something. So, In a sub panel, your ground and neutral will always be separate. In a uh, main panel, they could go on the same bus bar. So that's just something to be aware of. Always make sure you're following the proper codes. And this panel is quite messy just because it's been worked on in the cold and dark and everything else out here in the barn. So. Okay, now we're going to hook up our neutral. We're going to go ahead and bring our neutral across to this side just because there's a lot less stuff going on over here. We're going to go ahead and put that there. If you were using a GFCI breaker, the neutral would go to the breaker as well. It's basically, I haven't really explained it, but a, a GFCI, ground fault circuit interrupter. What that does is basically watch for a differential in current between the hot conductor going out and the neutral coming back. And if it sees that differential in current, it'll open the circuit within milliseconds to save you from getting electrocuted. So if you're, say, in the uh, bathtub and you decide to bring the TV in and set it on the side of the bathtub and watch it, and the TV falls into the bathtub, the GFCI will detect that leakage to the water to you and trip instantly and save you from getting electrocuted. So that's why we use it in an application like this is because we don't want the water trough to get electrified and have a horse get electrocuted. Um, so it's the same, same principle, just on an animal instead of a human. So we've landed that. I'm going to bring you over around here a little bit. We've landed that neutral right there on our neutral bus bar. And now what we're going to do is we're going to put our 20 amp breaker in. We're going to make sure it's off. We're going to run that hot conductor down around like that. And we're going to go ahead and strip it and put it in the breaker. Now I do want to point out that when you're doing electrical in the U.S. anyways, in a residential application, 
A 20 amp breaker requires 12 gauge wire. A 15 amp breaker requires 14 gauge wire. Now you can use 12 gauge wire and put a 20 amp, I mean, uh, yes, you can use 12 gauge wire and put a 15 amp breaker on it if you want. But the thing you don't want to do is start here with 12 gauge wire, for example, go to an outlet, switch to 14 gauge wire and go to another outlet, and then come back here and put a 15 amp breaker in that. While it would work, and it's technically safe and legal, the problem is, is if somebody comes in behind you and sees 12 gauge wire in here and a 15 amp breaker, and they're having problems with something tripping that breaker, they may throw a 20 amp breaker in there, and that will overpower the rest of the circuit and could cause a fire. So we've got the breaker on. We're gonna go ahead and knock the knockout out on our panel. I'm gonna back you up just a little bit. Now, the panel goes up there like that, so we know we wanna be on this side of the panel, and we wanna knock this knockout out right here. So what I like to do is just grab my pliers, grab it like that, and bend it down, and bend it up and down about three or four times, and it usually comes right out. Now, when I put my cover back on, I like to open my door, and see, so I can see my breakers like that, and line it right up. Then I get a screw started up here, like so. Get another one started over here. And that's gonna hold the cover while I get the rest of the screws in. So we're gonna go ahead and tighten these screws up, turn the power on. We're gonna take you back in and show you the water trough. We're gonna put the water heater in the water trough and wrap this up, so. Okay, we're back in the barn. We've gone ahead and got our water trough back in and we've got it filling up. I'll set you down to show you that. So water trough right here, it's a 100 gallon trough. The wall between the stalls is right here. So half the trough is on the other side and half is on this side. And that way the horses can share the one trough. The heater goes in there and we're good to go. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you the receptacle, explain the buttons on it, and we're gonna plug the heater in. So let's get on over there. See if you can uh, see what we're doing. So there's our receptacle. And right there in the top corner is a green light. That's telling us that the receptacle has power and is on. Now there's a button here labeled test. If we push that, you'll see it went out and the light went out. That's telling us that the circuitry inside works. So now we're gonna push the reset button and you'll see the green light came back on, telling us we got power. Now you wanna look at your manufacturer's recommendations and you wanna uh, push that test button every so often as they recommend. I think most of them tell you to test it once a month, but it is a good idea to test it. So Sue's gonna grab the camera here, and we're gonna go ahead and put the water heater in and wrap up here. So this is a 1500 watt, I believe it is, immersion heater. It's meant to go right in their trough. The minerals, of course, collect on it and make it kind of interesting, but we're gonna go ahead and set that down in there and plug it in. Now, we will end up having to come back, like I said, and dress this cable up. Any questions, leave them down below. Um, look for the video coming up where Sue gives you the tour of the whole horse barn. Um, I showed you a little bit, but not much. So, Like and subscribe, and come on back.